We're going to do a f maybe a few episodes, I'm not sure exactly how, what it'll come out as, but on um, the design of social software or collaborative software, we're going to kind of do a bit of a mix. So there we go with a, a less spinny chair. Let's see if I stay still. So we're going to start with the kind of 20 plus years of research that have underwritten uh, the design of that type of system, but then connect that to things that we see a lot more of now, which is communication, social platforms like those, or Snapchat, things like that. So one of the theories we talked about in the Filter Bubbles video that was a, a while ago is common ground. And that's the idea that you know what other people know about you or what you both know. In fact, there's a good definition. So common ground refers to the knowledge that people share and that they know the other shares. That's the important bit. So what I know that you know that we both know is a kind of complicated uh, but important aspect of how we collaborate. Um, and that helps us to determine a bit like who our friends are on social networks, but it equally makes collaboration easier if we're going to use software. The other aspects of why we collaborate is people's readiness to do it or willingness to do it. Um, if you're being forced to do it, that's not really a great way. But if you are being forced, then you need other things to be easier to make it worth it. Uh, and then the other aspect is uh, technology, technology readiness. Uh, and that's where we've made a lot of progress in this 20 plus years when we're looking at software for collaboration is making it better and easier for people to collaborate. The most important thing you need, and we're going to start referring to some paper now, is to think about who is using it when and why. So if we have a nice initial grid and we have time over here and place here, and then if this is the same and this is different, and then this is the same and this is different, we have then four possible quadrants of how people are collaborating. So if they're in the same time in the same place, like in a meeting room or two people in the same room coding, this would be the same time, same place. It might be that you're in the same time, but different places. And so this is when people are working together at the same time, but from two different parts of the country or two different countries, but you know, not physically together. That might be a Skype call or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. And then you've got same place, but different time. And this is people maybe working in shifts or maybe you've been working on a project and then someone else is taking over next week while you're away. So that's the same place, uh, technology that's there, but working at different times. And then you've got different time, different place, which is working in different time zones on the same system. So you're not working together, if that makes sense, but you are trying to collaborate. You could also have a dimension in there, which is the number of people who are collaborating, but that's going to start getting messy and we'll start doing that later. But this is a nice initial framing, I think, and it's one that comes up a lot in research and just in the design of software. So the real question, though, is what do you lose when you're moving away from the same time, same place? So if you and I are in the same time, same place, working together, uh, I could see that you're nodding because you, I've not said something stupid. You're approving of what I'm saying. Uh, and that's a little subtle communication, nonverbal body language that you're uh, saying to me. And you don't see that if you're in different places or different times. Uh, and there's lots of aspects like this, which are important for people working together. Um, that you just miss out on. So there's body language, there's nonverbal communication, so kind of grunting to say that you approve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this type of thing is uh, also missed out, um, unless you've got a live audio stream. But then if you do have a live audio stream, then maybe you don't know who went hmm, huh, because there might be four or five people. Um, you just miss the connection between, uh, well, I guess the only thing you have is exactly what people type in or exactly what people say. Uh, and so you need to build that into your software somehow. This is our key challenge. And to do that, we're going to talk about something different. And now we're going to get Lego involved. And more importantly, it's quite popular Lego at the moment. Strawberry laces. Oh, OK. Right. This yeah, is yeah. going to help us too, because strawberry laces are both useful and delicious. So let's get a board. We need a board. And then we also need some people to help us. Uh, so I'm going to have Yoda. Yoda's going to help us. Help you, he will. Uh, yeah. He's going to sit right there, hopefully, and stay there. And then there's something that Yoda wants to work on. So this is his document in the middle, or it could be some code, some collaborative or well, some coders are working on. And then in between that, and this is an important separation, is we have a user interface. And this is something that's often missed when people think about it. They just presume it's a person in the computer, but actually there's a person, the user interface, and then the artifact that they're working on. And so I'm actually going to take the top of the user interface off just for ease. Uh, and stick that back on. Doo -doo. There we go. So when we're working on software, one of the key design principles for user interface is that you get good feedback on what's happening. And this might be that if you're working on a Word document, uh, when you press save, it then says it was saved. Uh, if it doesn't say it was saved, you think, did it save? 
and then you're worried about has it saved. So you don't, if you don't have the feedback, then you lose it. And so what's, what is this? This is someone interacting with a document, pressing save, and then what they want is to get the feedback to know that it's happened. I'm going to pull that off there because that's tasty. And I can eat that later. So this bit of uh, strawberry lace there is recognizing that the person interacts with the artifact through the user interface. It's gone through the hole there, if we can see it hopefully. And then he's got some feedback back to him to say that whatever he did happened. It could also be like, uh, if you press bold on some text, you want to see it actually go bold, not just trust that someone else will one day see it go bold. Um, and this idea of feedback is a key principle for user interface design, mm -hmm. which is fine. But now we are going to talk about collaborative uh, software. So it's not just Yoda interacting with that document through a user interface. There's multiple people trying to do it. So if we can imagine that Anakin also wants to get involved, these pieces were chosen by my son, by the way, to help this communication. We're also going to bring in evil Jar Jar. He's a Sith Lord in this one. And for the fun of it, we're going to have, what, does he stick down? Maybe, we'll see. Bath time Batman. He might help too. Now they all want to work on this document together. Uh, and they all want feedback, fair enough. They've all got a user interface to work through. This is where I break everything. So there we go, we have four people, four user interfaces, one document that they're all trying to work on. And I think maybe we should get rid of Bath Time Batman. He's just going to fall over. Sorry, Bath Time Batman, we had a go. So let's work it with three people. Yoda, Anakin, and Evil Jar Jar. All trying to work through their user interfaces with the artifact. They all want some feedback, but to save time, I'm not going to put multiple laces in for them. But the thing we need to know as well as feedback on our actions is to know what other people are doing. And we call this feed through instead of feedback. So the artifact's going to feed through what the other people are doing. So say Anakin is making a change on the system. Well, let's add his own feedback, why not? He's got some feedback to say he's made some changes on the system, that's fine. He knows what he's doing. So how does Yoda know what he's doing? We also need a connection, which is Anakin interacting with it and then telling Yoda what happened. So now Yoda knows that Anakin maybe edited a paragraph or is editing a paragraph at the moment. And same with Jar Jar. Jar Jar wants to add in a picture to this document and Yoda wants to know that it happened. So now you can see that Yoda's got quite a few bits of information that's coming through. He's got his own feedback and he's got information fed through about what other people are doing. And this is a, the key issue that we're asking ourselves for collaborative software is uh, what information do we need to feed through that is replacing our knowledge of what people are doing because they're not in the same room as us or not working at the same time as us. But presumably each of those guys would also have that same amount that Yoda's got, right? Yeah, yeah, so Jar Jar, uh, it's not just Yoda that wants to know what Jar Jar did, Anakin wants to know what Jar Jar did. Actually, Anakin, oh, Jar Jar wants to know what he did himself. So he's got to have his own back. And also, Jar Jar wants to know what Anakin did. So now they all have feedback on what they're doing themselves and n as many bits of feed through from what other people are doing. Uh, and so you see if you've got like 12 people collaborating, which I've not got that many Lego pieces with me today, we then have quite a lot of feed through coming through and feedback. You're going to get to a point where you reach a limit in terms of what your user interface can tell you. Because if your user interface has got to show you the document you're working on, give you feedback on what you're doing, and reserve space for what uh, other people are doing uh, and data about that, then you've suddenly got a lot of design that's being focused on uh, what other people are doing alongside what you're doing and alongside the document you're working on. So say then you, if you want to, we could look, say, maybe you want to have some direct video chat on there as well, then you've got another bit of string not going by the artifact, just directly connecting all of them, which uh, that's going to start getting really messy if I do that. <laughs> but your user interface has got to handle a lot. And so you've gone from kind of standard user interface concerns of usability or feedback to kind of conveying what everybody's doing from different times and different places. So if it's a different place, it might just be live action of what they're doing. And if it's a different time, it might be somehow a historical record of what they did, or maybe kind of a replay of what they did. So let's talk about Google Docs as an example. So one feature you see in Google Docs is a kind of colored icon moving around where their cursor is on the document and if it's near yours. And if they select a whole paragraph, you then see that whole paragraph come up in their color. So this is an example of feed through coming through the artifact the document being highlighted by the user interface to show you what they were doing and what they were highlighting. But what does that not tell you? That doesn't tell you where their current screen is. It tells you where the current cursor is or what text they're currently highlighted. But you could imagine Google Docs could also highlight for you uh, like a rectangle on the document showing you where their viewport is currently on the system. 
And that presumes that their viewport is active, so you could also have it kind of that they've got a window in the background, and that shows you that that, that person's not interacting with you. So they're off playing solitaire or...? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you think, wow, they're thinking really hard about that paragraph for a long time, and you realise they're not, they're just at lunch. <laughs> so then this third dimension we're talking about is being termed telepresence, and that's because it's been related to lots of things like virtual reality as well. But it's the extent to which your physical presence has been uh, recreated somewhere else. So uh, if we had, say we take Skype, we talked about Skype earlier, that's giving you kind of full picture, maybe high definition of someone. We can see kind of maybe their kind of portrait photo type shape. Uh, so you've got head and shoulders. So that tells you maybe uh, some of their facial language, but maybe not entire body language. Uh, so it's been quite well represented to someone else. Google Docs takes a kind of low at a low rate level and it just sort of has metadata in there so it's you've got some signs of their actions represented by where their cursor is but not a kind of full view of them so they has a low a low telepresence of that person um, and so you're asking yourself with, with that theory how much telepresence or how much recreation of the person do we need is it going to be important to know that someone's thinking in google docs versus are they working uh, yeah, so is it going to be worth putting in a whole video section to use a whole portion of the screen to say that you want full res video? We see that a lot in uh, films that have just been sort of made up in 3D graphics. And actually in Star Wars, you see them having these kind of hologram conversations with people as if they were in the room. There's obviously a potential bandwidth issue here, right? I mean, you can only fit so much strawberry lace through those bits of Lego. Sure, yeah. <laughs> So actually one thing I mentioned earlier was number of people involved in it. And so uh, if you're imagining working on a document with a set number of people, it's fine to try and convey what each person is doing. But when you're talking about a crowd, which is what we tend to be talking with Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or anything like that, we tend to be getting kind of summative, uh, different time, different place numbers about what we've got. So number of retweets, which could have been at any time. But when you log back in, you can say, oh, I've had an extra 50 retweets or something on that. Uh, and this is giving us a kind of, yeah, a more scalable, uh, different time, different place feed through of what people have been doing. So we've um, talked about some theories now, which we're going to refer back to in the next couple of videos. Um, and what we're going to do over the next couple of videos is look at the specific example of how uh, a feature of Twitter has been designed and how people use it the difference between what it's designed for and how it's used. And then we're going to come back at the end and talk about a range of other software and some social phenomenon that exists because of how the software is designed and how you can change the software to maybe influence how that social phenomenon happens. So sometimes your floppies would die, so you often would make backup copies. Um, let's try this one. Sounds more hopeful. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Taking a break. <laughs>